name is Sarah Berkeley Tolchin, and I would like to celebrate Gallery's 50 years by reading a poem uh, from my most recent collection, What Just Happened, which came out in 2015. The poem is called South Beach, and it's about me and my daughter, Jessie. I let her drive on the narrow road down to the beach. Between the dunes with their russet ice plant hair, she was 13, piloting the car with infinite care. The sea was boiling mad, climbing the beach. Ice green at the curled over tops of the waves, then darker green and churned up sandy foam. She stood at the edge, taking video with her phone, blonde hair blown across her sea green eyes. In an instant, the gods could decide to snatch her back. I could no more hold her than the fine sand. I could no more keep her safe than the wind or salty air. But we stood together there at the ragged edge of the land, and the churn and rush of the waves merged in a rising choir, a melody not sweet but urgent, uncontrolled. It sang of me and her and of the earth that rose bold from the featureless ocean, the hill of the world and of all mothers and their wild, unpredictable girls. And the sun god, a phoenix, a lit on the hill where we stood, with her filming the waves, and me holding on to her in my mind, in my imagination. So it felt as if I would always have her near. And then we walked back up the sandy path to the car, and we got in and smiled at each other, and I put it in gear. As part of the celebration of Gallery's 50th anniversary, I'd like to read a poem by one of my favorite gallery poets, Derek Mahon. It's called Afterlives, and it's dedicated to James Simmons. I wake in a dark flat to the soft roar of the world. Pigeons neck on the white roofs as I draw the curtains and look out over London, rain fresh in the morning light. This is our element, the bright reason on which we rely for the long-term solutions. The orators yap and guns go off in a back street, but the faith doesn't die. That in our time, these things will amaze the literate children in their non-sectarian schools. And the dark places be ablaze with love and poetry when the power of good prevails. What middle-class shits we are to imagine for one second that our privileged ideals are divine wisdom and the dim forms that kneel at noon in the city, not ourselves. I am going home by sea for the first time in years. Somebody thumbs a guitar on the dark deck while a gull dreams at the masthead. The moon-splashed waves exult. At dawn, the ship trembles, turns in a wide arc to back shuddering up the gray lock past light ship and buoy, slipway and dry dock where a naked bulb burns. And I step ashore in a fine rain to a city so changed by five years of war, I scarcely recognize the places I grew up in, the faces that try to explain. But the hills are still the same, gray blue above Belfast. Perhaps if I'd stayed behind and lived it bomb by bomb, I might have grown up at last and learned what is meant by home. 1987 was a significant year in my life for a number of reasons. The principal one was, it was then that Gallery published my poems in this beautiful book with this beautiful cover, Poaching Rights. I'd like to read two poems from the book. They're both elegies. The first one is an elegy for the Cork footballer Tom Creedon, who died very tragically in a lorry accident in 1983. Um, and the poem is, is uh, spoken in the voice of the Cork uh, football supporter. Monster Final. In memory of Tom Creedon, died the 28th of August, 1983. The Jarvis to the west side of the town are robbers to a man. And if you try to drive through the gap, they nearly strike you with their whips. So we parked facing for home and joined the long troop down the meadow sweet and woodbine scented road into the town. 
by blue Killarney's lakes and glens to see the white posts on the green, to be deafened by the muzzy megaphone of Jimmy Shand and the testy bray to keep the gangways clear. As for Tom Creedon, I can see him still, his back arching casually to field and clear. Glory McCroom, goodbye Tom Creedon. We'll be back next year to try our luck in Cork. We will be back next year, roaring ourselves hoarse, praying for better luck. After first mass, we'll get there early, that's our only hope. Keep clear of the car parks, so we're not hemmed in. And we'll be home, God willing, for the cows. The other elegy um, is for our neighbour, and my neighbour growing up, Jermac, Jermacauliffe, in whose house, in fact, we now spend our, uh, our summer holidays. Um, he was an efficient farmer with uh, um, pride in his knowledge of horses. A noted judge of horses. The ache in his right arm worsening morning by morning asks for caution. He knows it's boding, cannot be wrong about this. Yet he is more concerned for the planks in the float that need woodworm treatment before drawing in the hay and whether the coarse meadow must be lined before it will crop again. Still in the pallid dawn he dresses in the clothes she laid out last night, washes in cold water and sets off, standing in the trailer with his eyes set on the Shrove Fair. As long as his arm can lift a stick to lay in judgment down the shuddering line of a horse's back, he'll take his chance, ignoring his dream that before September's fair, He'd be mumbling from a hospital bed, pleading with nurses to loose the pony tied by the western gate. One of my favourite book possessions is uh, Hailstones, the 1984 gallery um, book of, of Heaney poems. Um, it's, it's very significant for all kinds of reasons. Um, the poem I want to read is a, a sort of pre-elegy by Heaney for his father, um, The Stone Verdict. Heaney's father died in 1986, um, two years after the publication of the poem In Hailstones. Um, and the, the poem is generally read, when it's read in the Hall Antrim, as an elegy for Heaney's father after his death which it works very well but actually of course it was a pre elegy it was written before he died and was uh, um, anxiously uh, uh, describing what uh, what his death will be like uh, he, he and his father to whom he was deeply attached was notoriously taciturn The Stone Verdict when he stands in the judgment place with his stick in his hand and the broad hat still on his head, maimed by self-doubt and an old disdain of sweet talk and excuses, it will be no justice if the sentence is blabbed out. He'll expect more than words in the ultimate court he relied on through a lifetime's speechlessness. Let it be like the judgment of Hermes, god of the stone heap, where the stones were verdicts cast solidly at his feet, piling up around him until he stood waist deep in the cairn of his apotheosis. Maybe a gate pillar or a tumbled wallstead where hogweed earths the silence somebody will break at last to say, here his spirit lingers and will have said too much. It's a great pleasure to be able to celebrate uh, 50 years of Gallery Press and uh, I'm Paul Muldoon and uh, I'm going to read a song lyric um, of my own um, a little later but I'd like to begin by reading uh, an excerpt from a play, um, Woman and Scarecrow, by Marina Carr who's one of my favourite uh, Irish writers. Scarecrow takes woman's hand, pierces vein in her wrist, a fountain of blood shoots out, Scarecrow dips quill into woman's wrist, a cry of pain from woman. Woman, we don't belong here. There must be another earth. 
And yet, there was a moment when I thought it might be possible here. A moment so elusive, it's hardly worth mentioning. An ordinary day with the ordinary sun of a late Indian summer shining on the grass as I sat in the car waiting to collect the children from school. Rosalka on the radio, her song to the moon. Rosalka pouring her heart out to the moon, her love for the prince. Make me human, she sings. Make me human so I can have him. And something about the alignment of sun and wind and song on this most ordinary of afternoons stays with me. Though what it means is beyond me. What I've felt is forgotten now. But the bare facts, me, the sun, the shivering grass, Rosalka singing to the moon. And I wonder if this is not the prayer each of us whispers when we pause to consider. Make me human. Make me human. And then divine. And I wonder, is it for these elusive prayers we are here? These half sentences that vanish into the ether almost before we can utter them. Living is almost nothing and we brave little mortals investing so much in it. And this is the lyric of a song which is included uh, in a book I did with Gallery a few years ago called General Admission, a book of uh, song lyrics. Got it made. I've lain here since mid-October, a glade scented with glade, just as I've got clean and sober, just as I got it made. And just as I'm going under, I've watched my life replayed. It's so downbeat, it's a wonder I ever got it made. Only in woodshop and Spanish, I got a passing grade. That year, my father would vanish. He must have got it made. I joined with Jean-Michel Cabot in the cabinet trade, the tongue and groove of a rabbit. That's how we got it made. That's me in the ruffled collar, the sharp suit and the shades. I look like a million dollars. Look like I've got it made. My heart was suddenly aching. Jess was a nurse's aide. Our child was long in the making. Somehow, we got it made. We moved out of that hog wallow at railroad in Kincaid. Though the rent was hard to swallow, we always got it made. The asbestos lined to rumour plywood, sprayed and re-spread. It all adds up to a tumour. And that's how it got made. The doctor was so soft-spoken, he'd split with Medicaid. It looked like something had broken just as I'd got it made. The coffin makers plug ugly. There's beauty in his blade. The coffin lid fits so snugly. Looks like he's got it made. 